Well, good morning. Uh, we are out here at Lydic Bog Nature Preserve uh, doing a virtual hike with Shirley Hines Land Trust. My name is Scott Namasnik. I am the botanist at the Indiana Natural Heritage Data Center, which is housed at the Division of Nature Preserves at the Indiana DNR. What we're in here is a bog natural community, and bogs are pretty, uh, pretty rare overall within Indiana. They're more common as you go further north in the country, um, especially into Michigan and Wisconsin. You'll see quite a few bogs, but here in Indiana, bogs are restricted just to the northern part of the state in what we refer to as the Northern Lakes Natural Region. And so these bogs formed many times in kettle depressions that were formed by large chunks of ice that were trapped between moraines or uh, glacial uh, sediment um, that as that ice melted, it formed a lake. And here at Lydic Bog, where we are today, this, this bog is referred to as a lake fill bog. So this was actually a lake and not, not that long ago, not that, that far in the past. And when you look at a core that Shirley Hines has done out here to see how deep the sediment is, what you find is that we're standing on a, a shallow mat of peat and sphagnum moss Beneath that is water, it's open water. We are literally standing on this lake right now for about 20 feet and then you have about five feet of sediment or so uh, at the bottom of that lake basin. So we really are standing on a lake. Obviously it's very vegetated. It's uh, fairly stable though you do kind of feel the ground moving underneath you as you walk. Um, and it's full of rare plants, things that are restricted to these bog communities where the, uh, the nutrient availability is quite low and so some of the plants have to adapt to that by finding other ways to obtain nutrients and many of those uh, that occur in bogs do that by eating insects. We have carnivorous plants that occur in bogs as well as various orchids and some of the trees and shrubs you can see right behind me here. Uh, immediately behind me is a beautiful shrub that's known as poison sumac, Toxicodendron vernix. And this is a shrub that's characteristic of bogs and of another wetland type in Indiana, the fen wetland community. Um, but really, you know, people, people often think that they're seeing poison sumac in their backyard or along roadsides. And most often that's one of the, the sumacs that does not cause a rash. But poison sumac, Toxicodendron vernix, does cause uh, a very severe rash in many people, just like poison ivy would, but maybe, maybe a little bit worse. Um, and this is a shrub that will turn uh, a brilliant red to maroon color in the fall, so it really is attractive. They have white berries that dangle from them as they mature. The sumacs that are not poisonous that you might have in your backyard or along roadsides have a red conical structure of berries, and those berries are, are sort of fuzzy. In poison sumac, those berries are smooth and they're white and they dangle, so very different. Poison sumac also has this very characteristic arch in a leaf. It has alternate compound leaves. So this is one leaf here with many leaflets. And that rachis of that leaf, or the portion where all of the leaflets are attached, is red. And it's often arching like that. So it's a very characteristic shrub, very gray bark, smooth bark, often very thick twigs as well on poison sumac. It's really a, a great shrub um, in these bog communities. And if you look right behind that poison sumac, the trees that are behind us here are northern tamarack, Larix laricina, which is another very characteristic tree of our bogs and fens here in northern Indiana. But overall, it's a rare tree in the state because it is restricted to these plant communities. And tamarack, as you can see, is a conifer, but unlike many of our conifers, this is a deciduous conifer. So in the fall, these needles will turn yellow, bright yellow, and then they'll fall off as we get towards the winter. And so these trees are basically naked throughout the winter and they form new needles each year. The needles on tamarack are also arranged on these short shoots. And so it looks like they're in these fascicles or these clusters along the stem, which sets it apart from many of our other conifer species like bald cypress, for example, which occurs further south of here, but does not have those tight fascicles or those tight clusters of needles. And as they mature, they do form cones, uh, as all conifers do. Start out kind of a maroon color and they almost appear to be soft, but as they mature, they turn brown and they harden. One of the characteristic plants that occurs in bogs is sphagnum moss. We have numerous species of sphagnum. And as a vascular plant botanist, I don't identify those to species. I leave those to the, the moss specialists. Um, but here's a good look at a mound of sphagnum. And now this is the, the, the plant that basically forms the peat that we're standing on within this, this kettle lake that allows us to be able to stand here. 
And so it's this very soft, deep mound. You can stick your hand pretty far into that. And this, this sphagnum maintains moisture and that allows a lot of these plants uh, to grow here, even in the driest times of the year because the sphagnum still stays wet and provides a growing medium. Growing on that sphagnum is a very characteristic shrub of bogs. It's a low shrub, typically not over maybe waist high, uh, knee to waist high. And this is Camadaphne calliculata, uh, which is called leather leaf. And so this is a leather leaf. It's a very colony forming shrub. You're going to see a lot of it when you're in bog systems. Sometimes it's the dominant ground cover uh, within a bog. And the leaves are entire. They don't have any teeth on their margins, or if they do, they're very, very tiny teeth. And they kind of have these silvery or uh, reddish colored rusty glands or hairs on the undersides that give it a, a characteristic uh, reddish coloration or rusty coloration to that shrub. It's in the heath family as are many of the plants that occur in bogs. So things like blueberries and cranberries, which we'll see as well, uh, are in that family. So in the spring, it forms urn-shaped white flowers that later in the season become fruit and here is the remains of one of the fruiting stalks uh, of a leather leaf. We have a number of willow species in Indiana and uh, many of those are not specific to certain habitats but there are two willows out here that do commonly occur in bogs and this is one of those. This is Salix pedicillatus uh, which is called bog willow actually and so it's very at home in these bog situations. Very easy to identify relative to our other willows because there are no teeth on the margins. The undersides are uh, almost a bluish gray color. They're glaucous, so you can wipe that bluish gray color off of there as well. And it's a low shrub. This is actually a fairly tall Salix pedicillatus. Usually they're um, only knee high or so. Um, all of our willows produce flowers, in most of them in the spring. We have a couple, one species that, that flowers in the fall. Um, but here are the remains of those flowers and fruit dangling from that Salix pedicillatus or that bog willow. When you're in a, a bog and you're looking at the sphagnum, you have to look really closely to find some of the small plants that occur uh, within the sphagnum, sometimes almost buried in the sphagnum. And what we're looking at here is round-leaved sundew, Drosera rotundifolia. So when it's in flower, each one of these small capsules, it's in fruit right now, but each one of those small capsules has five white petals, uh, a flower about maybe five millimeters or so across. Drosera rotundifolia is one of those plants that I mentioned um, needs to supplement its nutrients because we are in a low nutrient acidic situation. And so it's found a way to do that by trapping insects. And so it's, it's a carnivorous plant. It actually eats insects. And the way that works on the Drosera rotundifolia is that this round leaf blade that's covered in these tiny uh, sticky glands there, there are two types of glands on that leaf. There are glands that have a sugary substance, which is attractive to insects and, and causes tiny flies and ants to come and try to feed on that leaf blade. Uh, and then there are also uh, short glands that uh, release enzymes. And so when an insect is attracted to that leaf, it comes and starts feeding, then it realizes it's stuck. It can't get off of that leaf blade because of that sticky substance that's uh, released by those glands. And then the enzymes that are released by the other glands cause that insect to be digested, essentially. They create a bug soup, essentially. They just turn it into a liquid that the leaf then um, takes up and is able to supplement the nutrients of the plant that way. So really a, a, a pretty crazy adaptation that this tiny plant that occurs almost buried in the sphagnum moss has, has developed to be able to live in these uh, difficult conditions. So one of the biggest and best surprises when we first came into this bog was the discovery of an orchid that's uh, considered state endangered in Indiana and something that was not known previously from St. Joseph County. And that's called the green adder's mouth orchid. And we've got one of them here. This is one of the smallest orchids in the state. Its flowers are probably the smallest of any of the orchids that of the 40 some orchids that occur in Indiana. Um, this is actually a fairly large individual. Oftentimes the plants themselves only get three or four inches tall. This one is probably seven or eight inches tall. And if we look right here, growing out of this mound of sphagnum, avoiding the poison sumac as we do so, it's in fruit right now, but it, this is the Malaxis unifolia. It has a single leaf. Unifolia means one leaf. Single leaf on the stem that clasps around the stem. And then the inflorescence or the flowering structure is up at the top. And again, these are in fruit, so we have these capsules. 
uh, that form after the flowers. When it's in flower, the very, it has very inconspicuous, tiny green flowers. This orchid is known from uh, just a handful of places in the state. It occurs in bogs up in the northern part of the state. There's a bog uh, in Elkhart County where this occurs. Here in St. Joseph County, it also occurs in a weird uh, setting, kind of in the transition zone between a marsh and a savanna in Lake County, Indiana. And then it occurs down in southern Indiana um, in the uh, Monroe County, I believe it is, where it's growing in dry acid woods, a very, very different habitat. So this, this species really seems to thrive on the acid conditions uh, that occur in this micro habitat here growing out of the sphagnum uh, in this case, but also in acidic conditions, even, even if they're dry down in the southern part of the state. But a very unique plant and um, a, a, a decent sized population here at Lydic Bog. Bogs are well known for their uh, ability to produce cranberries. In fact, some places the bogs have been, uh, further north of here, bogs have been turned into cranberry marshes uh, for, for production purposes. And Lydic Bog also has cranberry. This is large cranberry, Vaccinium macrocarpon. <clears throat> macrocarpon means large fruit. When we're talking large though, we're still talking the size of a cranberry. So it's still only um, maybe three quarters of an inch wide. And those fruit are edible, and uh, they, uh, they form in the summer, and then they turn uh, a yellowish color first and eventually become red. And I believe they're, they're best uh, during the fall or even in the winter is the best time to eat those. Large cranberry has these very small leaves. It's a low shrub. It doesn't look much like a shrub right now, but it does have woody stems, and those leaves will die back, and then new leaves will form on those same woody stems the next year. Fairly thick textured. They're whitened underneath or glaucous underneath and a shiny green on the top surface, generally rounded at their tip or sometimes have a little notch at their tip as well. About halfway up the stem, there'll be a stalk with a flower on it. And those flowers are white to pinkish with five petals that are, um, that are flushed backwards. It almost looks like a badminton shuttlecock to me or like a shooting star flower, uh, I've heard people say as well. Um, and then those flowers, uh, again, later in the summer will become fruit and those become the edible cranberries. So as I'd mentioned, bogs are full of heath family plants. Those are plants in the family Iracaceae. They often occur in uh, acidic substrates of, of various wetnesses. But one of the, the ericaceous plants that occurs here at Lydic Bog, and in almost every bog I've ever been in, is Vaccinium corymbosum, or the highbush blueberry. And this is actually the blueberry that our cultivated blueberries have been cultivated from. Uh, when they're in the wild, they often produce slightly smaller fruit but they taste really good. They taste just like those cultivated blueberries. Once they're cultivated, um, the shrubs that had larger berries naturally were the ones that were chosen for uh, at, during that cultivation process. And so that's why the blueberries that we eat are much larger, but they are from Va Vaccinium corymbosum. One of the reasons that we're doing the virtual hike is that this isn't the type of plant community where we want a lot of people to come in and, and to see these things firsthand because of the sensitivity of the plant community itself, of the plants that occur here, um, the, the squishiness of the ground. We're leaving um, some trails behind us with just a couple of people out here. If you magnify that by having 15 people on a hike, you really get some, some pretty um, possibly detrimental impacts to the natural community. So we wanted to do a virtual hike to show uh, the types of uncommon and rare plants that occur out here at Lydic Bog, but to do that in a way that was as environmentally sensitive as possible. And Lydic Bog is now a state dedicated nature preserve. We have around 300 state dedicated nature preserves um, throughout the state of Indiana. And those are sites that are of the highest quality and they receive an additional level of protection above that which the nature preserve or, or I'm sorry, the, the, the land trust or um, the owner of that property can provide. So having a status as a state dedicated nature preserve uh, means that nothing can be taken from the site. Um, no, no plants can be uh, removed. Um, and, and we do that to try to protect the best places within Indiana. And so that's a program that's overseen by uh, the Indiana Department of uh, Natural Resources Division of Nature Preserves. Um, and again, we have about 300 of those nature preserves around the state of Indiana. A very common wetland fern in a variety of wetland habitats, but also here at Lydic Bog is marsh shield fern. 
We got some marsh shield for fern or Thalyptris palustris is the botanical name all through here. And this is a colony forming fern. So you'll see it does form colonies. You'll see it's not clumped necessarily, but rather forming a large colony uh, where we're standing. Not so dense that other plants can't grow through it, but fairly dense in this area. In ferns, we have a different set of nomenclature uh, or terminology, I should say. And so this entire, what we would normally call a leaf is actually called a frond. And these, what we would tend to call leaflets are called pinnae or pinna is the singular. And along that pinna are further divisions that we refer to as pinules. In all of our ferns, the reproductive parts are spores rather than flowers and fruit and seeds. So the spores for, form on different parts of, of the fern, uh, depending on the species that you have. In a marsh shield fern, the spores firm, form on the back side of the fertile fronds. So this is a fertile frond. You can see that the spores are beginning to form here. Here we're looking at a pink flowered St. John's wort and sometimes this is still kept in the genus Hypericum. Other botanists place this in a different genus, the genus Triadenum or Triadenum. And this is what I would refer to as Triadenum or tri Triadenum virginicum, the Virginia St. John's wort. And I mentioned it has pink flowers. It also has leaves that have a grayish cast to them and they're stalkless and almost clasping the stem. This plant has a flower that likely would open later today. Uh, they tend to open late in the day. Um, they don't stay open very long, so oftentimes you don't see the flowers open on these triadenums. We have two species in northern Indiana, the other being triadenum fraseri, and that one you rarely, rarely see with open flowers. In fact, most of the time they remain closed and pollinate just within that closed flower, pollinate themselves. Another plant um, that's very common in bogs is this shrub, Spirea tomentosa. Uh, this is called steeple bush, and typically this plant has pink flowers. It's in the rose family, so those tiny flowers collectively make that very showy pink inflorescence, but individually are quite small, but they have red stamens and lots of stamens and lots of pistils as well, um, giving that kind of um, feathery look to that inflorescence. I say they're usually pink. There is a white form of this species where it has pure white flowers, we also have another species, Spirea alba, that always has white flowers. Both of these are shrubs. They're low shrubs. They get five or six feet tall is typically the tallest you'll see them, oftentimes much shorter, but they are woody. And so each year those leaves will die off and fall off and new leaves will form from those same woody stems each year. One of the common willow species that occurs in bogs, uh, its common name is silky willow. Salix sericea is the botanical name. And it gets that name because of the silvery, silky hairs on the undersides of the leaves, as well as on the, the uh, woody growth, um, the newer growth, especially the last couple of years of growth, have that hairiness to them. Um, this is a species that is commonly found in bogs, around the perimeters of bogs, sometimes forming dense colonies within bogs. It's a shrub species. So we have some species of willows that become trees. This is one that, that remains as a shrub. This is a very small example, they will get uh, 12 to 15 feet or so tall um, and form fairly dense patches. So this is a this is a much easier way to see this willow where you're not walking through a dense colony of it. Our loosestrifes get a bad name because of one invasive plant, purple loosestrife, that occurs in degraded areas and along roadsides and has started to invade um, high quality wetlands as well. But this is a loose strife that is a native plant and it's very common in bog wetlands uh, as well as other types of swamps and marshes. This is Decadon verticillatus, which is called swamp loose strife. It's technically an herbaceous plant, but it grows very shrub-like. It almost becomes woody at the base and kind of arches. And so it can make walking through it very difficult because it has that arching growth form. It's called Decadon verticillatus. Verticillatus is a reference to the flowers that occur in verticils or in whorls within the axles of the whorled leaves. And those flowers never look quite perfect. They always have very wrinkled petals, five petals usually on this one, kind of purplish colored. Um, they almost look a little bit fringed. They look like they're past their prime, even when they're in their prime. But together they form a very nice uh, purplish uh, inflorescence in the axles of those whorled leaves. This is a plant that when I'm doing botanical surveys 
and I'm in a marshy or bog-like habitat, and I see this plant in the distance, it often is a sign that the ground underneath it is very unconsolidated. I've seen situations um, here in South Bend within a lake, there are floating islands that had formed, and this plant kind of ringed those floating islands, and you feel like you're walking on fairly solid ground as you get towards that island, and then just before you get to that island where this plant is growing, this Decadon verticillatus or, or swamp loosestrife, there's no bottom. It essentially drops out and you're walking or floating. In that case, I had a personal flotation device on. I was basically floating in some sort of soupy, mucky substance beneath me, but no solid ground whatsoever where this plant would grow. So here again is the swamp loose strife, Decadon verticillatus, and you'll see that these flowers are in those verticels or those whorls along that stem. But then right back here, we have a plant in the same family but one that is very undesirable in situations like this, this is purple loosestrife, Lithrum salicaria, which is a Eurasian species that was brought over to the United States in part due to its attractiveness. When it is in full flower, people do seem to think this is attractive. Um, and this was used in the landscaping trade. And uh, one single plant, you can see how many flowers are up here, but there were also flowers all down this stalk. So one single plant produces thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. And those spread and they colonize disturbed areas in particular. It's kind of surprising actually to find some of this out in Lydic Bog where things seem to be very stable. But it's possible that there was a little disturbance here like a deer trail or, or some other uh, impact of the soil that allowed this plant to become established here. Purple loosestrife um, in comparison to the swamp loosestrife has a dense spike of flowers at the top of the plant. Again in the swamp loosestrife those flowers are in verticils um, within the world leaves. Each one of these little bracts along the stem has a cluster of several flowers and that creates that really dense spike that you see up at the top of this plant. In addition, the leaves on purple loosestrife are usually opposite. Now occasionally you'll see some plants that have some alternate leaves. Occasionally, occasionally you'll see three leaves in a whorl on purple loosestrife as well, but more often than not you're going to see the leaves being opposite. Here's one in fact that has three leaves in a whorl. Um, but usually the, the leaves on purple loosestrife are opposite, so two leaves coming out from the same point on the stem. And so this is something that you're seeing now, and 30 seconds from now you will never see this individual again because our stewardship person here, Doug Bodka, is going to remove this plant um, to make sure that it doesn't continue to spread out here in Lydic Fog. I don't think I've ever led a hike anywhere where I didn't talk about sedges, at least to some extent, because sedges are found in pretty much every plant community, whether they're wet or dry, whether they're acidic or calcareous, um, whether they're shade or full sun. So you can find sedges anywhere, and that's part of why I like them so much. But I do want to point out, well, I'm going to point out one sedge, but I'm going to mention a few others that are here. So we've been walking through a lot of this yellow lake sedge throughout, which is this tall, coarse sedge. Um, throughout much of the bog. We also saw some At Atlantic star sedge, Carex atlantica. This one is Carex utriculata, I should say. Uh, we saw Atlantic star sedge, Carex atlantica, around the perimeter of the bog as we first entered. But this is the one I really want to point out. This is not a Carex, but it's in the genus, or the, the family Cyperaceae, so the sedge family. And this is Dulichium arundinaceum, three-way sedge. And it gets that common name, three-way sedge, from when you look down at the plant from the very top, you can see very strongly three ranked leaves. The leaves come out in three directions all the way down the stem. <clears throat> Delichium arundinaceum is an interesting sedge because most people think sedges have edges, right? They think that sedges have triangular stems. And a lot of our sedges do, but we have some that are round. Delichium is one of those that has round stems in cross section. So rather than being triangular, they may be a little bit sort of angular, but they're very bluntly angular, almost round in cross section. But the other unique thing about Delichium is that all of our other sedges have solid stems. Delichium, like a grass, all of our grasses, have, with the exception of corn, have hollow stems. And Delichium has hollow stems. So if you were to break that stem off, there'd be nothing on the inside, no pith or anything. It would be totally hollow, like a tube. Bogs are home to several uh, different species of carnivorous plants, and we had seen um, the round leaf sundew previously. And here we have purple pitcher plant, Saracenia purpurea. Purple pitcher plant has a different way 
of uh, trapping and digesting insects than does the sundew. And its mechanism is to form a leaf that's totally enclosed and has an opening at the top that holds water. And so it will trap insects within that pitcher and digest them within the pitcher itself. So our pitcher plants, because of the climate in uh, the northern portion um, of the range of this species, does not have a lid on it. Some of the species in the further, further south in the United States have a lid that sits on top of the pitcher plant. Not quite closed all the way, but mostly closed. And that's due to the hotter, more humid conditions that are there where ours don't need to have that lid. They're not going, the water's not going to evaporate the way that it would in the southern portions uh, of the distribution of species in that genus. Um, so we don't have a lid on our pitcher plants. They developed without that lid. But as you look closely at the leaves of these pitcher plants, you'll see they do look like little pitchers full of water. And if you look at the, um, the modified hood, which sticks up around the opening, you'll see tiny hairs pointing downward. Those hairs serve to keep insects from being able to cl climb back out of those pitchers after they've fallen in. So once an insect is fallen into that pitcher, it's in water, it's trying to escape, it's swimming, swimming for its life, it's becoming more and more exhausted, it finally gets to the edge of that pitcher and starts to climb up and it can't climb because there's downward pointing hairs. And so it's stuck there, it eventually dies of exhaustion. The plant produces some enzymes. Um, at least that's one way that we think that, that the digestion happens and that digests that insect and the plant uptakes those nutrients. But there's also thought that there is an actual ecosystem that occurs within these pitcher plants where there are midge species and uh, mosquito species that lay their larvae in pitcher plants and those larvae live their entire life phase within those pitchers. And they also serve to help in digestion of that insect that the pitcher traps to be able to uptake those nutrients. So pitcher plants are really outstanding and amazing plants. Another interesting fact about pitcher plants that I've heard, and I don't know if it's true, is that when these are in flower, and right now these are in fruit, so the petals have dropped, when they're in flower, they'll have purple petals, five purple petals that hang downward. And apparently this plant has nectar that is almost intoxicating to an insect. So an insect will come and feed on the plant, on the pitcher plant flower uh, nectar. It'll become drunk essentially, fall into that pitcher and be less likely to swim its way out because it's already somewhat intoxicated by the nectar uh, that's produced by the flowers. So really an outstanding plant um, found in bogs, also found in fens occasionally in the right microhabitats, almost always growing in sphagnum moss up in this part of the world. Late May, early June is the best time to see it in flower. Well, thanks for joining us on this virtual hike to Lydic Bog, owned by Shirley Hines Land Trust and managed by Shirley Hines Land Trust. We hope that once the trail system has a boardwalk, you have a chance to walk out on that boardwalk and get a sense of, of uh, the bog uh, overall from that point and get to see from a distance some of the things that we were able to see here today close up. So thank you, and uh, we hope to see you again soon.